Hello, it's good to have you back here on the Glory and Praise Show on Off the Pulpit on Catholic SG Radio. My name's Andre Acha, he's Keith Nibrana. Now, this is how it works on Off the Pulpit. We get in a member of the clergy, and then we discuss matters of faith. And in our discussion, we also hope that, uh, you know, we get a personal perspective of things from them, or we might even hear a personal journey from them. Now on Off the Full Pit today, we have a first timer. Ooh, yeah. he's none other than Father Simon Ho. He is the assistant parish priest at St. Anne's Church in the Singkang and Pungol area. He's also attached to the Archdiocesan Liturgy Commission. Thank you so much for joining us today, Father. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you, actually. <laughs> okay, so let's get right into it. Okay, so Father, on the 21st of November, the Church celebrates the memorial of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm. Now, what is this all about that we are celebrating? And is it even in the Bible? Well, as the uh, term suggests, the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we celebrate St. Anne and St. Joachim, the parents of Mary, who brought Mary into the temple, presented her to the Lord as she was a little girl. And she was given over, made over to the service of God. And from tradition, we know that she stayed there in the temple all the way until she was betrothed to Joseph. Oh, and she actually... We, she stayed at the temple, as wow. well as what the record seems to suggest at least. Right. right? Okay. Um, if you look at the Bible, you'll flip through the whole Bible from the beginning to the end, you'll never find the presentation of Mary in the Bible because it's not recorded there. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, the Bible which God inspires as his words or his love letter to us was focused especially in the New Testament on Jesus, on the early church, on hmm. what his teachings were, what he did, his miracles, and what they reveal about who Jesus is and what the Lord wants to draw us into that relationship with him. And so naturally, in that sense, there's not much focus on the other characters in the, in, in the, in the gospel story. Mm. But we do have an ancient Christian tradition that relates this particular event to us, the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And you know, as Catholics, we have a big importance on tradition as well. Tradition mm -hmm. is not just something that was written in the past, but tradition is something that's also lived in the life of the church. Mm. So if you look at historical records, at least, the first record that we know of is in the Protevangelium of St. James also sometimes known as the Infancy Gospel of St. James, and it's attributed to St. James, the brother of Jesus, but scholars tell us it's quite unlikely to be written by him. Yeah. Okay. But nevertheless, <laughs> it was well known by the turn of the 3rd century. So we have church hmm. fathers like Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, who quotes from it, and many other church fathers hmm. in the region of the East who talks about it in a very positive way. So we know that at least it was composed towards the end of the second century and it was well accepted in the Christian world. And it is in there, the Protevangelium mm. of St. James, that we have this account of St. Anne and St. Joachim, the parents of Mary, bringing Mary to the temple and presenting her to the Lord when she was three years old. But it's not just an event that's in the past that, you know, the church over the years looked at it and said, oh, there's something there, let's celebrate it, right? <laughs> mm, it's something that's mm. been lived in the life of the church, particularly in Eastern churches. So the Eastern uh -huh. church, they have been kind of like commemorating this liturgical tradition, even all the way as early as the early 6th century. You know, they even have a mm. basilica in, say, in Jerusalem that was dedicated to Mary's presentation. Right. And it was from there that says it spread throughout the entire Eastern churches. So mm. from the East, you know, actually as Latin Catholics, we do steal quite a bit of the festivals from the Eastern churches, yeah. especially mm. dates of Mary, you know, and we, it, that, that feast was so popular, it entered into the Western church about the 9th century, and by around the 16th century, it became a permanent fixture in our Roman Missal, and that's continued all the way into the liturgical reform of Vatican II. We are still celebrating this memorial of the presentation of Blessed Virgin Mary on the November 21st. Ah, okay. I'm going to push it a little bit yeah. further mm. about, you know, why this thing wasn't recorded or this uh, event wasn't recorded in the Bible and how it, you know, later came to be recorded. Why not just stop at the four Gospels? I mean, you know, also it could... Mm cause confusion mm. if you if 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 mm. I may say that. Yeah, so in fact we see how the church writes the, the, the scriptures, right, the very early stage was focused really on Jesus because they yeah. thought that Jesus was going to come very soon. So capture his writings, ah. ca capture his teachings, capture his miracles, capture his story because that's the crucial part. 
No, but as the church progressed, and then the church realized that oh, Jesus is not going to come very soon anyway. Mm-hmm. But really, more than that, also as as the Christians started to reflect on who this Jesus is, that he is not just mm. God, but God who became flesh, God who became man. That's when they started to realize what the full implication of that really means for the Christian faith, and they started right. to want to collect the stories. Why? Because if Jesus is truly human, mm-hmm. then he also has. Grandfather, he has a grandmother. Right. You know the stories of his parents become something interesting as well for the Christians to know because, as we know, as a human person, we are also influenced by our family background. Yes. And Jesus, who the Christians believe is truly God and truly man, would also have been influenced by his family stories. How did Mary come to be able to give herself totally to the Lord? Mm. So all these stories started to be collected. Mm. But at the same time, more than just that as well, because if you look at the early church right now, you know, for us many centuries later, we have kind of like so okay with that theology that Jesus is truly God. But in the early centuries, the focus was, the difficulty was for the early Christians to defend Jesus' humanity. Ah, okay. So there was this question, you know, for example, we know from the early sources, people are saying, are you sure that Jesus was born a virgin of Mary? You know, was, mm. was he an illegitimate child, for example? Mm. And in Gnosticism, <clears throat> one of the great heresies that was going through the early period of the church. The Gnostics believe that, well, Jesus could be God, no problem, but they do not believe that he could take on flesh because they believe in that sort of idea mm. that God does send emanations. God does come out in that sense from the Father in that sense, yeah. but he cannot take on flesh because flesh to them is evil. Flesh is sin. Oh. He cannot take on flesh and sinfulness. So that was a real shocker for the, for the Gnostics. So that's why as the early Christians reflected and came into contact with Gnosticism and came into contact with all these heretical teachings, the mm. early Christians started to realize it's important to also collect stories because otherwise we have a Jesus who just mysteriously appeared and then he just gave his teachings and then he did his miracles and then he disappeared and how do we respond to the Gnostics? So the family stories of Jesus started to become important and collected. So the Protevangelium, for example, would tell us, you know, the what we have in our tradition, Joachim and Anne are the parents of Mary, <clears throat> and how Mary, when, when she was three yeah. years old, was presented in the temple. So that that was one of the writings that collected these stories together. And of course, some people will say that hey, these stories seems very similar to the biblical stories. Are you sure they're not kind of fabricated? Mm. Right. But if you look at how early this came out, it was by the end of the second century when this writing was kind of collected together, right, in the Protevangelium. That's still very early, very close mm. to the beginning of the church, people will still remember the stories of Mary, the stories of Jesus, especially we must not forget in a very oral culture. Yes. The stories are passed on. That's right. right. So We were just talking about uh, oral tradition and yeah. scripture just yeah. yesterday. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So these stories will probably be recorded and mm. if it's really different from what the Christians knew, people will not be accepting them. Right. But nevertheless, of course, being pious people, even when I write my homily sometimes, <laughs> you, will, you will use biblical motifs, right? You will right. use certain things that people are familiar with to lead them into the story. I mean, that's what Jesus did that's anyway Jesus in his did parables, well. that's right? Jesus yeah. did as well. So it's yeah. not surprising that birth evangelium, especially how Mary was conceived, her presentation of the temple, kind of like draws on certain elements from the Old Testament, like the conception of the prophets, you know, who uh, the parents were stir out, as well as how Samuel was presented ah, to the temple. Right. So that's from the historical perspective we can see. But I think if we look at the saints, because for us as Catholics, what mm-hmm. the saints teach us, what the saints reveal to us by their lives, by their reflections are also important. And the saints tell us that there's probably a deeper perspective to this as well. And that is, for example, St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, this great devotion to Mary, right? Mm-hmm. He speaks a lot about Mary's humility. Yes. You know, and we all you know in the litany as well, we talk about the humility of Mary, the humble virgin, you know, who mm. always makes herself small in that sense to allow God to be magnified in her. Yeah. And so Louis de Marie de Montfort would reflect and says that, yeah, Mary actually desired to be kept hidden in that sense. Mm. Even the greatness which God has given to her, she didn't want it to be manifest so that all the focus can be on Christ, her son, on the goodness of God rather than on herself. Right. Right. And as we know as the church history progressed, by the time of the 4th century, there were a lot of Christological controversies, questions about, is Jesus truly God? Is right. Jesus truly human? Is he partially God, partially man? Of course, now today, the creed summarizes for us very beautifully, but you can imagine in the 4th century, it would be very mm. messy, you know? Yeah. What's really happening? What's the teachings of the church? What is truth? And that and was only at Nicaea, right? It was only at Nicaea when things started to be clarified, but it mm. will continue for a few more centuries, all the way to Constantinople, a few more councils later, before the whole creed is 
is finalized and the faith is more or less, in that sense, uh, definitively taught. But as the Christians reflected on those questions, they realized that Mary is a very important figure in understanding who Christ is. Mm. Because if Christ is truly God, then Mary is mm. truly the mother of God. So in that sense, the church meditates on the role of Mary. It recognizes who she is in relation to Christ, how she anchors the humanity of Jesus. And that's how the, you know, the teachings, the Mariological doctrines and dogmas, like Mary being the mother of God, that came to be promulgated. And in that sense, from then on, in the history of the church, the devotion to Mary, that, that prominence of Mary started to become more and more important. If you reflect on it and think about it, it's mm. quite interesting as well, right? Even yeah. like children. Mothers happily stay in the background usually. Yeah. But when a child is attacked, Ooh, oh, yes. mothers come out to the front and defend it. They're strong defenders. Mm. Correct. And we see that you know, in how Mary has come out in a sense theologically you know, in the teachings of the church and how the church how the Christians reflect precisely to kind of like show us who her son really is mm. and even in this day and mm. age Mary continues to be the important figure to tell us who Jesus is and therefore who we are you know, today after Vatican II a lot of reflection on Mary focuses on her being disciple of being yes. someone who follows the word of God of being someone who is courageous right and all this are true about Mary and they do, are not just about Mary herself they mm-hmm. reveal something about Christ and they reveal something about us too. I think the, mm. and that's why in uh, chapter 2 of uh, John, right, the wedding at Cana, mm. her so-called intervention, being a mother and also understanding how that couple must have felt and then knowing what her son could do mm. truly uh, and yeah. I think he couldn't say no to her as well. Couldn't say no to her, but, not, but not, it was, not than just that, I think. Yeah, mm. it, yeah it, was, it was him that she actually really wanted to put forward. To put forward. And I think also, when I reflect on that wedding at Cana, you know, I was always thinking how amazing it is that these stewards actually mm. did what Jesus told them to do. Because if you look at the story of the of the changing of the water into wine, Jesus merely told the servants, pour water into these six stone jars. Right. He never said at one point in time, you know, that now this is wine, and bring the wine, let's do it. He didn't say that. He simply says, fill it up with water and take some out now and bring it to the steward. And in my own reflection, I was thinking about it. It's like, if I were the servants, I would never have done that because it's like, this is an unknown man telling me to put water into the stone. Yeah, jar. you don't know what was inside, right? It, <laughs> it makes no sense. It makes right. no sense. Yeah. And yet these servants did. And precisely because they were faithful, Jesus performed his first miracle, his first sign, which led his disciples to believe who he is. And of course, if you look at the theology of it, it's a lot richer. You know, the six jars mm. of wine you know, mm. points forward to the fullness that will come eventually in the kingdom of God when Jesus himself dies on the cross to save us, to right. pour mm. the Spirit. That's but right. at that point in time, where did these servants get their courage from? And I think it's true, the courage of Mary. Ah. When she told them, do whatever he tells you, yeah. I think Mary's courage, you know, even as a woman, to see what's happening and asking Jesus, her son, to do so. And Jesus didn't exactly give her a very positive it, sound it, answer. It didn't yeah. sound, yeah. <laughs> that courage was within her and she passed it on to the servants. Correct. So I think that's where I see the role of Mary really is in our lives today very often, to follow Jesus, her son. Mm. Ah, that's actually very lovely of you. You ponder truly, uh, also yeah. like our Blessed Mother, we truly ponder on the role that she has played. And for us also to ponder on how we, in a sense, can also uh, not so much imitate, but to emulate also uh, what she has done. Mm. I think it's so beautiful. So uh, what you shared, you know, about how Mary, um, or the understanding of Mary and her role you know, over the centuries has been developed by the church. Mm. And maybe at first it, it, it was all not very clear, but somehow the Holy Spirit has also inspired the church and the, the church fathers uh, to realize that, hey, this is a very significant person yeah. and she has she has a big role to play even now for all of us, you know? So, Absolutely. yeah, but we want to zoom in on this presentation. Yeah. Uh, on this. Uh, so tell us exactly what happened and why is that truly important such that we need to celebrate it as a memorial. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So we look at the Protevangelium of St. James, right? Um, mm. What the story tells us is Joachim and Anne, they will stare out, they were not able to have a child and then no true, and they were, they were quite old at the point in time already and they were mm. praying and asking the Lord to grant them and eventually through the miraculous intervention of angels, you know, 
they yeah. they were actually going to conceive a, a child, and of course Mary was born. And what the story tells us is that about three years old, Anne and Joachim decided to bring Mary to the temple to present her to the Lord. And mm-hmm. when the parents put Mary down on the steps of the temple, because there's the steps leading up to the the, the, the the temple threshold itself, Mary did something that was beyond what her age would have normally done. You no, know, she started to dance or ascend the steps by herself, depending on which version of the story you look at. Right. But thereafter, she ah. stayed in the temple and she did not cry for her parents. And the parents were just amazed at how she was so comfortable in the temple. Yeah. They just left her there. Okay. Wow. And it's interesting because also if you look at the traditions that were written down, they don't always fully agree on all the points. So in the Protevangelium was written earlier, yep. and St. Anne was the one who took the initiative. Mm, she realized okay. there's something special about this child and she wants to, to present Mary to the Lord. Of course, Mary herself, as we saw in the story, how she was able to walk or dance up the stairs herself, yeah. indicates that she also wants it and she also desires this close relationship with God in the temple. Right. But if we look at a later writing, uh, kind of like the gospel of the birth of Mary within about maybe the 8th century later on, mm. it's kind of changed a little bit. It became the angel who instructed St. Anne and the angel who instructed St. Joachim that this child Mary is special and has to be brought up to the temple oh, and dedicated right. to God. But whichever case it is, no, we look at this whole thing, it is not just simply about Mary, right? As you say, everything about Mary points back to Jesus, points back to us as no fellow disciples of the Lord. And Mm. Mary's dedication is linked to our Christian life precisely because we too have also been dedicated to God. Yes. And that was when we were baptized. That's right. When we were baptized, we were washed clean of our sins. We are Mm. also dedicated to God just as Mary was. Mm. Mary stayed in the temple of Jerusalem. She became very close with God himself and was prepared to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit through baptism. We also become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So we look at the dedication of Mary in the temple as more than just celebrating even it happened, you know, how many centuries yeah. ago. It's more than just about Mary. Yes, we celebrate what God has done in Mary's life. But mm. what is true in Mary's life is very often in its way, true also and reflective for us. And it reminds us of our baptism. Am I also dedicated to the Lord? Am I also actually living out my own presentation to the Lord? You know, living out how I give my life, myself, my talents, my skills, mm. whatever resources I have to the Lord, not just for my own benefit, not just my own family, yes. but also yeah. to the benefit of others, to, to be charitable, to further the mission of the gospel, to build our community, the church. Do I also hunger for God? You know, we mm. talk about this, Mary staying in the temple. It's more than just a physical right. staying, being sheltered from the rain and all that <laughs> over there. She is also close in the temple, close, therefore, to God. The mm. intimacy with the Lord. And of course, as our Catholic doctrine has it, Mary is conceived immaculate, full of grace. Mm. That certainly has an impact on her, right. nonetheless. But through our baptism, we too have become filled with God's grace. And we too have become washed clean. Do we, however, also desire to hunger for that presence of the Lord and thirst for His presence? Mm. The psalmist always speaks about, Lord, I yearn for your dwelling place more That's than right. I prefer that to the thresholds of the house of the wicked. No, do we also yearn to be with the Lord wherever we are? And we don't need to go to the church. We don't need to go to the adoration to be with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Where we are, God is present in our hearts. God is present there. Do we, are we consciously aware? Do we con- consciously seek His face, His will? Mm. Which leads me now maybe to, if we can further, just a little bit more, maybe from a more theological or uh, biblical aspect on, again, this the significance of the mm. presentation. And as you mentioned, our baptism as well. Mm. Would you help be able to help us, you know, look at how from biblical times, you know, this this whole idea of being presented to the Lord was so sacred, actually. Mm. You know, and every family mm. uh, did that for their, ch- their children. Well, to be presented to the Lord means basically a consecration to the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. Mm. So that's what presentation, consecration really is. If we look at the law of the Old Testament, the Torah, the, the first few five books, you know, the Pentateuch, um, the law of God is very specific in saying that the firstborn males, mm. these are the ones who are consecrated to the Lord, whether they are of animals or of humans. Mm. So if they are the clean animals, they are sacrificed to God. So the firstborn males that opens the womb, that is sacrificed to God because it belongs to the Lord already. Of course, it draws on the story of Exodus where God mm. went through the land of Egypt, killing the firstborn of 
of Egyptians and thereby freed Israel from slavery. Right. And therefore, all the firstborn of Israel also belongs to God. Right. Okay. So the interesting thing there over there is the donkey. The donkey is an mm. unclean animal, so it cannot be sacrificed, but yet it can be redeemed even mm. as a firstborn. But for all human sons, okay, we don't practice human sacrifices in Judaism. <laughs> so God. all the human sons are firstborn. They have to be redeemed from the Lord. That's what right. the presentation of Jesus itself was. When Mary brought Jesus to the temple, first of all, it's a purification of her for a childbirth because she really gave birth to, to right. Jesus mm -hmm. and also to purify, in a sense, to, to redeem Jesus back. Right? But by, by the law of God, every firstborn is already consecrated. To the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, but out of piety, not all Jews, but some Jews would go beyond what the law does. Not much like for us Catholics, sometimes the law demands mm. that we, uh, the law asks that we specify the law that we uh, abstain from meat, for example, on Friday, and sometimes right. we do more, you know, fasting from uh, other things, only uh, subsisting on bread and water, whatever it might be, an extra right. form of prayers. So there were also some Jews we know from mm. the Old Testament which goes beyond the law. So one example is the prophet Samuel. The first book of Samuel, mm -hmm. we have Hannah. His mother. That's right. You know, also presenting Samuel to the Lord, but more than just redeeming him back, she left him at the service of the temple right. at Shiloh at that point in time. That's right. So that was one Old Testament. It seems example. so cruel at that time. It seems so cruel at that time. <laughs> but for them, what is, what is going on is I am giving my child back to the Lord, in this case, the firstborn son, as he deserves to be. Yeah in the mm. service of God. And of course, we know what God did through Samuel. He, yeah. in a sense, is the last judge and also the first prophet for Israel as well. Right. You know, he anointed the king Saul as well as David. Very important, pivotal figure, figure in the entire Old Testament history. So Mary's presentation will be something similar to that because we have no, in the Torah, in the Old Testament, it doesn't say that women or girls are to be presented. Yeah. Mm. Right? But Mary would be in the same sense, the same vein of the Joachim and Anne recognizing that they want to give Mary back to the Lord, presenting her, therefore, into the temple, allowing her to, to stay there. Right. Right. Of course, besides that, of course, um, we also have the sense of the faithful in the early church right mm. from the beginning. Right, The church realized, the faithful realized that, you know, from the earliest moments of her life, Mary must have been dedicated to God. That's how she's able to give her fiat, her yes to the Lord, so readily when the angel mm. came to her. So... As the church, as the early Christians reflected in that sense, very naturally it was we be moved to this account of the presentation, which already existed, as we said, at the end of the second century. It was already written down, which means it was probably circulating around the Christian communities much earlier. And it became a kind of like a focal point. It says, yeah, at a dedication, Mary was also in a similar way consecrated to the Lord's service. Okay, mm. And of course, as we see the whole thing, as a, how our Catholic theology develops and how the dogmatic definitions change and evolve mm -hmm. and deepen our understanding, the dogma of immaculate conception really is that pushing back of Mary's belonging to God totally mm. all the way to the first moment of conception. Uh. Right from the first moment, because of the grace of God given to her, she is preserved from the stain of original sin. She became the temple of the Holy Spirit. She already belongs to the Lord. And so now in yeah. the dogma in our in our mind, we can see that the presentation really is slowly living that out, actuating mm. what she already is. Right. Through the grace of God, of course. So God is the ultimate initiator really of all that is happening. Right. But if we look at presentation, it may be tempting to say that, oh, it's just a nice little event. Yeah. But as I reflect on our own life as well as what the church really speaks about, how, you know, God's grace built on our nature. I do think that the presentation of Mary in a temple was more than just an event in that sense, mm. right? Because we always look at this, oh, no, how nice that Mary was able to say yes to the angel. You know, we think that maybe because the angel came with such wonderful grace, such wonderful <laughs> news, Mary had no choice or Mary was somehow special given grace at the moment just to say yes to the angel. But I don't think so, mm. right? Because precisely what happened when she was presented to a temple, she stayed there. She became familiar with prayer. She became mm. familiar with God. She attuned herself, even though she's full of grace, she attuned herself to hearing what God is speaking to her in her life. Because mm. I was thinking to myself, it's like many years ago, of course, in my <laughs> own reflections, like if an angel were to come to me right now and says, you know, wonderful, you know, Simon, you are, the Lord has asked you to do this wonderful thing. I'll be like, how do I know? It's not my finger, not my imagination. Right. right? Because tell people about it, everybody says you're crazy. Right. But how did Mary recognize that that was truly the angel? Yes. And this is what people come to me even to this day. Right? How do yeah. I hear what God is saying? Am I, yeah. How do I know that's yeah. God? voice and not my own voice. That's true. And any person who really wants to desire to follow God's will and marry is certainly one of them would have this question. 
And I always says, well, God speaks to us in a way he, he speaks to us. He has a familiarity. That's why he speaks of himself as a shepherd. He, we know his voice. Mm. So to grow that, we have to slowly understand how God speaks to us. Yeah. And there's no reason to think that that's not true for Mary. Even though she is full of grace, she is a human like us. She is a right. sister in the flesh as well. And so she would, in the temple, as she mm. grows up, as she listens to what the priest says, as she, as she listens to, in a prayer, to what the Lord is saying to her, she becomes acclimatized, attuned to what the voice of God is. So that when the angel appears to her, the message is surprising because that's something she never expected. Mm. But nevertheless, it's some, the angel, the presence of the angel is not something that, are you real? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it a devil in disguise or whatever it is? Yeah. She would have no doubt in that sense. Right. right? Mm. So I think for me, that presentation therefore also prepares Mary truly to be that mother of God. Right. Right. And when we look at the whole story of how it happens, how did the presentation happen? Of course, the later stories, as it reflects, everything gets attributed to God. The angel told Joachim and Anne. But mm -hmm. I think there's some beauty in recognizing that it was Anne's action that says, I want to present Mary to the temple. I feel that there's something special about Mary. I want to bring my daughter and just leave her in a temple. Hmm. Because isn't it true that in our lives, it's really sometimes you know, true, the coincidence is so caught of life right. where right. each of us interact with each other. We, we, someone says something to us that, hey, that is the answer, that it's the solution to what I've been thinking and wondering and pondering about. Yep. All these that seems to be you know, human coincidences, right. they are really, in that sense, God's providence. God works in that marvelous God little way, you know? The yeah. God incidences, as you say, so beautifully, Keith. <laughs> so to me, it's reminding us really that mm. in our lives, right, we sometimes want to think that, oh yeah, I want to do God's will. So let me just sit down and just look at the blessed sacrament and Lord, show me what you want me to do. And I expect to see no, no, beyond lights no, there. No, no, there you know? <laughs> that doesn't happen most of the time. If it happens, honestly, you, you and I wouldn't believe whether that's really what the Lord is saying to us. But don't look down on the little things that we do. Right? Mm. How do we discern a vocation? How do we discern what God wants us to do? We start by doing something. Yeah. And we see what the fruits are. And it's, I think how Mary grew to understand her vocation also, right? Mm. In a very simple, ordinary thing. Nothing more simple in the sense of going up to the temple and then she enjoys herself there, she stays yeah. there. But just wanted to check, yes. in terms of the cultural context of the day, mm. was this a norm for females? You mentioned first males and, mm. or firstborn males, mm. but for like a, a daughter, would that have been common? And then them staying in the temple, was that a common thing at all? Well, we are not too sure historically mm. whether the temple mm. has temple virgins in that sense. So there are allusions. So we look at the Mishnah, the Talmud, uh, writings of the Jews that after right. the first few centuries, you know, mm -hmm. they collected these writings as the Jews were scattered around different parts of the world. They realized they need to preserve the oral tradition that was that was handed on to them in a written form. There are writings, the texts in the Mishnah, the Talmud, which mm. seem to suggest that there are virgins in a temple. As in they what stay do they there. do? Okay, when they stay, it's yeah. not so clear. But wait, they, they do indicate that. Well, you know, the temple has a veil, right? No, yes. I mean, Jesus, yeah, yes. the veil was That's right. Who made the veil? Clearly, the angels didn't make the veil. <laughs> God didn't give the veil to the temple, the trees to hang it up. So, according to the Mishnah, the Talmud, virgins will be sewing oh. the veil. Wow. And they'll be okay. making two veils each year. Wow. So it doesn't, and they don't, the, the writings don't exactly indicate whether they stay in a temple or not. Uh -huh. But we look at Luke's gospel, right? Ah. And Jesus was presented in a temple. Yep. Right. Um, of course, we know what Simon did. There's a very small character that most of us just glance by. Right. Anna the prophet. Anna, that's right. She was also there and she was praising God and for what this child would do. But what we are told in Luke's gospel is now she's an old lady. She's mm. a widow. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. And she stays in a temple. That's right. Day and night, never leaving the temple. Mm. But she never leaves the temple. Then the temple, we do know the temple do close at night. Then where does she go? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So. The, 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 the circumstances would seem to suggest that there probably is some place where Anna mm. could stay. If Anna could stay someplace in a the temple, then possibly Mary could be staying as well. Oh, Very interesting. interesting. I, yeah, but, but that also explains, I mean, if she was, if being in the temple, mm. being involved there, you know, listening to um, the priests, you know, and, and being so immersed in that mm. uh, and most of all, growing in intimacy with God, as you rightly put, yeah, all, all this was in a way preparation for her yeah. uh, for that fiat at the Annunciation.
Yeah. Yeah. So it makes points. sense out the importance of our own history. Don't discount our own yeah. history. Yes, that's so right. Sometimes we see our life as all this brokenness and woundedness, but God yeah. can make use of them. Mm. God can make use of the big and small things in our life to build us towards something. And also sometimes we see that, hey, how, yeah. why am I facing such challenges? Why do I have this person? If only this irritating person is not there, you know that my <laughs> life is so much yeah. happier and better and easier. But perhaps the person is there for a particular reason because God yeah. works in our history and he can draw good out of it. He can give yeah. us a mission through our history. You know, Henry now I speak of the wounded healer, isn't it? Yeah. Right through our wounds, in that sense, when we allow the Lord into our wounds, we become in turn the instruments which allow Him to pass His grace onto others. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that reminds me of something that St. Ignatius of Loyola has in his spiritual exercises, you know, recognizing our graced history. Yes. So no matter mm. how, as, as you said, Father, you know, how messed up you think it might be, yeah. God's grace still working mm. in, in so many different events, you know, mm. it's better we come to recognize. And in some not so good things, we know also God can bring good out Correct, of those. Out of it. Yeah. If we allow yeah. him yeah. to also. And God's grace doesn't just work precisely through only the good priests, the holy yeah. priests, the holy saints, people <laughs> that's that's right. through each of us, who knows how God is inviting and Absolutely. God is shaping our lives. Mm. Yeah. Interestingly, because yeah. you also mentioned, you know, something like this, Father, the reason why the uh, scholars wanted to know more about Jesus mm. and to know and understand his incarnation, his family was the one, you know, that they would obviously want to go to, right? And, yeah. and so, I mean, I guess it really actually explains uh, this this reason why, you know, Our Lady's presentation now becomes something so important, so much so that the church makes it a memorial. You know? An obligatory memorial. Yeah. And, well, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's still, you know, it's raised to, to, to a level for us to also, again, as you said, to ponder a little bit more mm. about how our own lives can be more or less, uh, I suppose, I wouldn't say, you know, we can't all try and be like our Blessed Mother, you know, as much as we would like to, but at least the example of being obedient and saying yes to God. A lot of times... On this program, we try to make sense of the things we are celebrating. Right? Yeah, why we're celebrating. Yeah, it, it's one thing to know these things in our head, like, ah, oh, this happened. Mm. Great, wonderful, you know. But in terms of how we live it out, what impact does it make in our life? You know, what can we do on the day for ourselves? Uh, so so would you say reflecting on like our baptism or our grace history is a good way to commemorate the day? Certainly, to reflect on how God has been working in our lives. Mm. And perhaps like how God worked in Mary's life, no, it wasn't in always through angels, whatever it was, through right. direct intervention. Yep. To go back, especially as the year is drawing to a close, mm. where have I missed what God could be doing in my life? Because yeah. I was so intent on focusing on something I didn't realize God's work elsewhere yeah. mm. to remember that to ponder because one of the things we know about scripture from what Ma who, of who Mary is one of her great quality she is one who's able to sit and to ponder and yeah. to reflect to treasure things in her heart I think yeah. for the piece of the presentation we remember our baptism we remember our grace history but we also remember the moments of history we haven't thought it's graced yet mm -mm. when actually it could be I'll be graced by the Lord mm. and I think we can ponder with Mary and ask her to help us to reflect back yeah. And to therefore draw from there what God is working in our lives. Because ultimately what Mary shows us is that life of fidelity to God. Yeah, We want to follow Mary and emulate her. In that Sometimes situation. in our human condition, it, it's very difficult to be able to see grace uh, in, yeah. you know, in difficult mm. moments. Yes, it is. You know? and, and so hence, it's, it is important really to ponder when really there are moments of grace to be celebrated and to be really pondered upon. Mm, yeah. And I find in my own experience also, you know, sometimes it helps um, having someone to share that with, you know, mm. so ah. I share the story and I'm like, oh, it's so difficult, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then sometimes the person as a sounding board, you know, comes back, a spiritual yeah. director, for example, yeah. comes yeah. back and helps me identify those graces uh, that, hey, don't you see that this is already already happening you know mm. like for example uh, just, just a random example but when I was in the novitiate we had some experience um, looking at our family tree speaking and being able to process it with someone mm. uh, this person helped me to see that hey don't you realise this 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 yeah. don't you realise that, that, that? Yeah. then I realised that oh, I, I see how God has been working and I see also now in my position what God is inviting me to do to, so that things are different for 
the future also. Correct, correct. And I think mm. that's what separates, in a sense, gossip and complaining, you know? Mm. This is trying to that's find so true. presence, right? People always come and say, say I gossip and everything else, <laughs> right? There's, what's the difference? Partly, you know, gossip, I just wanted to put the person down. I want to talk how bad a person is. Well, I'm sharing what's burdening me. I'm open mm. to the possibility that there's a grace moment there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we forget that sometimes, yes. sadly, as I said. Yes. Okay, I've got a question. Huh? When Mary and Joseph presented Jesus at the temple, okay, so 40 days after his birth, mm. what do you think that meant for our Blessed Mother? You know, how would she have seen this? You know, would she have seen it as a rededication of her own life to God also? A rededication of her own life as well, like a renewal yeah. of her dedication. Yes, mm. yes, yes, that's right. Well, I think it's possible because uh, the writings don't really give us very much in terms of what Mary was thinking when she presented Jesus to the temple. But as I was reflecting and preparing for this session, I was thinking it's probably not such a linear, direct, no simplicity. Okay, yeah. Because mm -hmm. the same word was presentation was used and therefore when Mary presented Jesus to the temple, she also remembered her own presentation because as we said, the idea of presentation for Jesus being the firstborn son is a bit different, different. from Mary's presentation. Mary stayed in a temple, at least so the writing tells us, Jesus, we know, went back home. Jesus' right. presentation was really that redemption of the firstborn son you know, from the Lord. So there's a bit of a difference. But if we remember what happened at the presentation of Jesus, mm. I'm sure the Holy Spirit inspired the Luke to write all this you know, for his mm. own reasons, not just nice little bits of information that he's around <laughs> behind. You know? Mary encountered Simeon. Mm. Yes. Simeon gave a prophecy you know, of how her own heart would be pierced because his child is destined by God for the fall and rise of many in Israel. Absolutely. Mm. And we know in the, in the history of the church, as the church reflected on that, it's one of the sorrows of Mary. Yes. One of the pains that she, the, the first annunciation in a sense of, 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 the, of the passion of the Lord, that he will have to suffer in some way to bring about the redemption of his people. But if we look at how Simeon was speaking at that point, Luke is very deliberate to tell her that Simeon turned to Mary even though Joseph was there. Yeah. You know, you don't often have in the Israelite society a man speaking to a woman by herself. Yeah. Normally you would speak to a family together. Yeah. So it's significant that he was speaking to Mary, of course, not just because Mary herself would be pierced in the heart, right? Because we know that Joseph wasn't there. But I'm sure Mary, being the perceptive woman that she was, mm. would also realize at that point in time when Sim was telling her that and not Joseph, mm. that Joseph is not going to be there when this happens. Ah. That Joseph is not going to be around. And so it will be again between her and God, and she is trying to bear whatever this sort of sorrow will be. And I think mm. for Mary, as she realized that, being that perceptive, pondering woman that she is, mm. I would not be surprised if at that instant, she also, in a sense, rededicated herself, her yes to the Lord. Just as she gave her yes to the angel, it was probably at the moment she also says, yes, Lord, whatever it may be, even if I am going to bear this without mm. the benefit of Joseph being around. I think she. It's almost like a double this. sorrow at the same time. Yeah, no? no, she must have also at that time must have realized the extent to which her dedication and her whole yeah. life would be yeah. tied mm. into this whole plan of God. My goodness! Right. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Easy. So yeah. as we as we as we think about now this. Uh, I mean, this additional thought, Father, uh, really makes us even now, I, I mean, I think it should, uh, mm. as we move to look at our Blessed Mother, how how can we, or could we ever emulate, you know, her life and her dedication, the way she lived for God? Um, and as we move towards Advent, is it something that, we can make incarnate in, in the way we live our lives then. Well, if you look at how the church looks at Mary, right? she's the first disciple, mm -hmm. she's also our mother. So if she's the first disciple and we are disciples of Christ and we are her children, then certainly the grace of God is also given to us mm. to be able to emulate. Of course, not we want to emulate in a sense of, Lord, I want all this pain and sorrows. I don't think we are sadomasochists in a sense. We do not want the pain. That's right. Mary didn't want the pain. That's you know, true. She dedicated yeah. herself like, not for all these things, but yeah. when it happens, as the Lord allows it to happen, she's able to 
take it into her and still continue to say her yes always to the Lord. Mm. And that is what we always have to be called to do as Christians. That's what Jesus says: take up your cross and follow after me. So we look at what it means to emulate Mary, especially as we now enter the season of Advent, isn't it? Mm. Right, mm. is to always be like Mary, even though she sees something new being. Demanded of her to always make that yes once more to God, but it's not something that's going to come as you no know, Simeon or some the bishop or the cardinal that and you I want you to give up your son for the seminary, you know, not a sense perhaps. But very often I notice even in my own life. Mm. Just last week we we're looking at the reading from the Book of Revelation, the complaint of Jesus to the church in oh, Ephesus. Yes. That's right. You have less love and use. Correct. Mm. Isn't it true that when we go through the hum and drum of life, you know, yeah. we we forget the reason why we are doing this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For me as a priest, I'm sure for you in your capacity in you know, running the happy the archdiocese in marriage between husband and wife in your company, whatever you're doing, yeah. it is very easy for, to forget that we are doing this ultimately out of the love of the Lord, for the right. love of God, for the love of our neighbor, for the love of the other person. So I think as we did reminder. To remember, as Mary did, you know, why did she? Why was she able to rededicate herself? You know, when Simeon tells her this sad prophecy that she will be mm. alone to bear this cross, this this, mm. this pain, this sword that will pierce her own heart. You know, because she has grown to deeply love this God to whom she is dedicated when she was a three years old child, and remembering that love, how God has never failed her. How right. God has been present, even though things may not always be wonderful and perfect. She may not always have a way yeah. in that sense. Yes, right. Nevertheless, God was present, and therefore she says, "Yes, I can go through this, even if that means I am alone." Mm. And of course, we know how Jesus on the cross didn't make Mary alone. Yes, He gave her John. That's right. And he gave her also, of course, more than just John. He gave all of us as well to her. Yes, the church. So we can also. Yes, in our frailty, in our fears, in our anxieties, we will doubt, we will struggle. But we can remember the example of our blessed mother, mm. what she has gone through. And a motherly figure is always someone who seems present to us. And she is also present to us. Yeah. So well said, Father. So well said. Okay, next one. You know, earlier I asked about how the how this memorial, you know, how we should celebrate it on an individual sort of personal level. Mm. Um, I was just wondering, how does this memorial have any significance for you personally? When I first prepared for this talk on the presentation, mm. um, I must say that the presentation of Jesus was the one that's more significant to me personally. Why? Okay. Because back in a seminary, we seminarians would normally receive our cassocks. Uh -huh. On the feast uh, of the presentation of the Lord on right. the second of February or, or right, nearby, right, right, right. we do it in our second year. You no, know, after we finish our honeymoon year, the initiation year, mm. just doing very little things except to pray and hopefully to pray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get our cassocks in a sense. It is the official acceptance into the seminary to begin the process of formation to the priesthood. Mm. You know, welcoming the community. So I've always, since my uh, my my cassock presentation, I've always imagined and thought of myself asking Mary, says, "Please snuck me in the basket of Jesus. You know, please." Snuck in a blanket, hide me somewhere, and present me and Jesus to the Father. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because I know how unworthy I am, all my sinfulness, all my weaknesses, all my limitations, my history, and everything. And was that, that child I faith that I had was like, mm. God the Father will never reject anything that Mary presents. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Very good. So for me, that was so that's why the presentation of the Jesus always had a, a, a greater importance. But as I reflected on this, mm. what the mm. feast of the presentation of Mary meant, her total belonging to the Lord, and how that began, in that sense, her living out that identity, slowly acclimating, knowing who this God is. Mm. As I reflected on it, there was an element that was extra to me, and that is reminding me of my call to celibacy. Mm. Right? Because the priesthood, well, the call to celibacy, the call to the priesthood are not exactly the same thing. They're yes. two separate calls. Absolutely. Right? Of course, in our Latin tradition, whoever is called to the priesthood is also yeah. given a call to celibacy. But as what you know, Aschenbrenner and quite a few other you know, spiritual writers would say, it's important to discern both callings because yes. they, they do mean different things. Celibacy is not just about not getting married. It's not yeah. a negative thing. That's right. Celibacy is really a positive thing to have a relationship with Jesus. Yes. And because of that relationship with Jesus is therefore the entire church community. So there has to be that separate call 
do that celibate life, mm. giving of myself to the Lord and the giving of myself to the people of God. And I received that when I was in my second year of formation. I was going through a particular different period of, form, of time in my formation. I was struggling and everything, you know, wondering whether am I really called? Am I really supposed to be here because I don't feel joy? I don't feel life at times because of difficulty is going around. But as I was at a particular retreat, with our retreat master, you know, then this text of scripture that was, was, was given to me, you know, that I belong to the Lord. Mm. And as we reflected on that belonging to the Lord, at first it was just a very nice, oh yeah, somebody who likes me, somebody who cares for me. Mm. But as I reflected, you know, the Lord saying, nope, it's more deeper than just that level. I belong totally to the Lord. Yes. And that's when I realized at that point in my second year of formation that I do not even belong to myself. Mm. I can no longer give myself to anybody else, any other person except to the Lord and to the Lord, therefore, to the whole church community. So later on, as I did my own formation, my understanding of the classes of spirituality, that's when I realized that that was a call to celibacy. Oh, wow, but beautiful. Precisely that what the celibacy entails, right? I'm giving myself totally to the Lord and to the people of God as well, that total belonging so mm. that I cannot belong to anybody else. And that's precisely what Mary's presentation really is. She belongs to God completely, Totally. And thereafter, she begins to live that life. She becomes you know, account, uh, attuned to what God's Spirit is speaking in her own mm. heart. And for me also, if I look, as I look back at it, it is beautiful because that moment really marked my own growth in my own spiritual journey without me realizing it until now mm-hmm. when I look back. Mm-hmm. That's why reflecting and looking back is so important. It was really after this incident that my own relationship with the Lord grew and developed. It was only after I have heard this call that the Lord says, you belong to me totally. That's where my own journey, my own mm. process of growth really happened. So it was really, really through that that call to celibacy where my mm. own faith journey, my own relationship with the Lord developed and that's where I am here today. Now, if I look at it also, I had another crisis in my fourth year or end of the third year of formation and this happened again before. If not for that journey, from that time when I heard this call to celibacy, this total belonging to the Lord, you know, mm. in my that year of growth as well, slowly, nevertheless, I was growing very slowly, but nevertheless, I was growing by the grace of God, thanks be to God. Mm. I would have left the seminary. So in that sense, oh my goodness. really, it's really mm. the hand of God working in mysterious ways that we never imagined. And you were talking about grace yeah, moments, grace history. Huh? Grace grace history. history. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that's what... As I reflected now, therefore, the presentation of Mary invites me to also remember my grace history and how... In that sense, there's a similarity in my own journey with Mary. Not mm. as a three-year-old, I was about 30 plus years old <laughs> at that point in time. Mm. But nevertheless, it was that, that movement of, of God's grace and dedication belong to the Lord and re, re-remembering what that means and what it should mean in my daily life now as a priest is what I'm doing, mm-hmm. including this, this session, this program I'm running. <laughs> Wonderful, Father. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you for sharing that. So, Father, as we move towards Advent and Christmas, is there a specific way that uh, you prepare yourself for this special time? Well, I'm in the liturgy commission, so I've been talking about liturgy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but because I also do love the liturgy very much. And I think the liturgical readings, the way that, how the liturgy is structured gives mm. us a very good way to prepare for Christmas itself through the season of Advent. But what is the season of Advent? You know, some of us start singing, you know, O Come, Divine Messiah, O Come, o come Emmanuel, right for the first Sunday of Advent. That's right. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the liturgy itself, there is actually a movement In the first part of the season of Advent, about two weeks to three weeks thereabouts of Advent, Mm -hmm. the focus is actually not on the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. The focus is actually on Christ's coming. Actually, that's what Advent is. Advent is the coming. That's right. The coming of Christ. And Christ's coming is not just at Christmas. Christ will come again on the last day. And it's one of the church fathers who speak about Christ. Meanwhile, comes to us in our daily lives as well. So the first part of the season of Advent really is that focus of the coming of Christ into my life. Mm. ultimately preparing for the second coming of Christ but to be ready to welcome him not just at the second coming when he comes again Mm -hmm. on the last day but also as he comes to us in our daily lives and that's what the first part of the season of Advent really focuses on and it's only later you know after the third week of Advent you know the last eight days before Christmas that's when the focus shifts dramatically actually Mm. to preparation for Christmas and that's where the readings itself the gospel focuses entirely differently. So I think it's important to to understand what the church is intending when she Mm. gives us a season of Advent. The first part is really, how has my relationship with the Lord been? Especially as we reflect Mm. the past year. Have I welcomed the Lord as He comes into my presence? Have I been aware that He's coming? Mm. Have I rejected Him? Have have there people in my life I tend to 
not see as the presence of Christ. Mm. And that's where he invites us to conversion, to renewal, so that we will be able to celebrate the fullness of the Messianic joy. Because what is the second coming of Christ? It's not about you know, the fire and brimstone and the end of the world in such a horrible way. The second coming of Christ really is the fullness of the Messianic kingdom. For those of us who love God, for those of us who believe in the Lord, we will be have our the resurrection, which is that fullness of life. We will experience God with our bodies as well as not just our souls. So it's to prepare ourselves really for that encounter of joy with the Lord. Mm. Joy which comes even in our daily lives. Of course, we see little bits of it. Right. Very often we miss it. All right. So for me, that's, that's one of the important things. So meditate on the scriptures. When I was studying in the States, I also realized because, you know, at that point in time, because it's winter, mm. snow, blankets, everything, and it's kind of like everything <laughs> slows down. But I thought that slowing down was very important. Mm. As ah. a preparation for Christmas. It's a preparation to welcome the Lord into my life. Actually, we are doing the reverse. We are doing the reverse. Yeah, we get yeah. more busy running around shopping and getting yeah. things done. But I think it's also in Singapore, right? We don't know how to slow down. We think slowing down is kind of like, you know, uh, not effect, not productive enough. But we can't be always high strung. We have yeah. to also take time yeah. to relax. Not by going on a holiday and then we need a holiday to recover from the holiday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but really it's that time to just slow down and just be with myself, be with the Lord and allow Him to speak to us. So I, I think it's important to find some time. Mm. Difficult as it is because we are always looking to the next Christmas party and how can we prepare all these things, buy gifts or everything mm. else. That's for the, for once, buy less gifts. <laughs> mm. you know, focus on what's essential, mm. which is my relationship with the Lord and how that in turn will impact my relationship with one another. You know, why bother looking for the best gift for someone that you love and then after the rest of the day, you end up at the rest of the year, you end up scolding that person for yeah. the little thing that he or she <laughs> did see about. Yeah. Right? So slow down to allow the Lord to speak to us. In my parish at St. Anne's, this year we are going to try making the Advent wreath a kind of like a centerpiece for our for our Advent preparations. Nice. Right? Mm. So, well, when I was in the States, that was when I was really introduced to the Advent wreath, but where I was, it wasn't something that was really talked about. It was just like, you like the candle, Lord, and that's it. Mm. Right, so how does the Advent we will play into our own spirituality? Well, I'm also learning in a sense, right? I'm, I'm a mm -hmm. priest, but mm -hmm. that's something I know everything. I still continue to grow through what Parish Priest Father Jopita is doing and what the people will also experience. So I look forward to that opportunity to grow. But as I reflect on the Advent Reef, I know there was one thing that I always anticipate. When can I light all the four candles? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because you light the first candle, then you light for the one week, wait, and then wait, the wait, second yeah. candle, <laughs> the waiting, and then the third you know? candle. You know, it's like, that's like 21 days, yeah. like, like the fourth candle. <laughs> But I think that is when it's training me also to that growth in expectance I mean, to wait in hope. I know the fourth candle will be lit, the, the weave will be yeah. beautifully lit <laughs> at some point in time. But meanwhile, I've got to wait. Absolutely. I've got mm. to be patient, which is not the easiest thing, I think, for me and probably for many of us as well. <laughs> when the instant generation, the phone, you want your phone to be the fastest and everything else. But I think that's yeah. what Evan calls us to. Yeah. To slow down, to learn to wait. Maybe to wait for the advent wreath, you know, <laughs> like the candles, like it looks so ugly, you have one candle, two candles slowly, but to wait more importantly for what the Lord is doing in our lives. And that's what really waiting for the second coming of Christ, waiting for the Christ to come to us in our daily lives. We know mm. he will come mm. because he loves us. We desire him. If we love him, we also desire him to come to us. He will come when, how we have to wait in patience. And that's what really the spirituality of Advent is, training us once again to be able to wait in patience and not to wait impatiently. Mm. Mm. Oh, so nice he said. So nice he said. So our dear friends, I, I, I truly think that, uh, you know, this memorial of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary couldn't come at a better time. Mm -hmm. Really, it, it helps us, you know, make a path towards Advent. You know, and, and as Father said, hopefully... This year, maybe, could be different. You know, we're not running around like clowns or like chickens, you know, with our heads. But maybe we slow down a little bit, yeah? Like our Blessed Mother. Let's take in what we are truly, truly uh, going to celebrate. Mm. The coming of our Lord. Truly, not just at Christmas, but His coming to us every day in our lives. 
That's right. That's right. So we've left you with a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different <laughs> things to reflect on, you know, including your graced history yeah. and also your year, how it's been so far. And we have something to help you actually. So for the next four weeks and off the pulpit, okay, so unfortunately it won't be available on video, but we do have a sort of retreat in daily life. Mm. So four podcasts, four 30 minute Recollections, if you like, presented by Father Greg Tan. He's a Jesuit, and he yeah we recorded this with him a little while ago, um, but it's four recollections to help us to yeah. reflect more on what Advent is. Really, this longing for Christ, waiting for His second coming. Um, so that will be available by, on podcast and of course live on Off the Pulpit every Monday morning at 8.30 with Encore broadcasts at 8pm on the same day and 5pm on the following day. Okay, mm-hmm. so look out for that. But meanwhile, we really just want to thank Father Simon so yes. much for sharing all his thoughts on this memorial we're about to yeah. celebrate. And you know, really you're very deep and very personal uh, sharing, Father. I, I, that yeah. is truly, uh, you know, the beauty of, uh, that, that's why we have this particular program. We thank you so much. We know uh, we've taken you away from the uh, parish as well, but we are very, very blessed and we are very grateful. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Kim. And thank you to all our listeners as well. We, we give praise to God ultimately for what He's doing through us. Amen. 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 I have certainly learned so much about Mary. You know, it, it feels Indeed. like I've gotten a bit more about this backstory of the <laughs> lady. So thank you so much for that. More to reflect and contemplate on. And don't forget, actually, you can also watch uh, this particular uh, episode of Off the Pulpit on mm-hmm. our Archdiocesan YouTube channel. Okay? Right. Uh, so as we thank Father Simon, we also want to thank all of you for joining us and for also supporting us. Keep on watching, and uh, I'm Andre, he's Keith. Stay tuned to Catholic SG Radio.